There are so many imminent warning signs for the dollar. For the first time, the Saudis are considering selling their oil to China, not in dollars, but in Chinese yuan. Russia is the number two oil producer after Saudi Arabia, and they're not using dollars either. We're looking at a paradigm shift. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, April 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, April 10th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Nick Giambruno, renowned speculator and international investor, joins us today. He is the founder of the Financial Underground and editor-in-chief of the Contra Speculator. Nick travels the world searching for lucrative investment opportunities, overlooked markets, and he specializes in identifying big picture, geopolitical, and economic trends, ahead of the crowd, helping others to earn outsized investment gains, and is a frequent speaker at investment conferences around the world. And we're delighted to have Nick as a return guest on SBTV. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Nick Gianbruno. Nick, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Hey, Patrick, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you back on, Nick. Appreciate the time. You know, it's been a while since we last spoke, and since then, you have a new project going on, the Financial Underground. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've launched a new uh, website and investment advisory called the Financial Underground, and really, it's dedicated to helping people get the big picture right. I'm uh, you know, known for finding big picture trends uh, before the crowd, and that's what I aim to do with the financial underground. Help people understand the real big picture, what's going on in uh, the global economy, geopolitics, and get them, uh, you know, help people get positioned right in light of the big picture. Because that is the, I think that, it, you know, in all my years of experience in investing and finance is that that is probably the most important piece. Get the big picture right and then find the pieces underneath it. So that's what I try to do at the Financial Underground. Let's go back in time a bit. Uh, you know, Nick, when Nixon was president, he built a triangle between the USSR, the then USSR, China and, and the U.S., and he basically played it where he would always have either the USSR or China in his corner and he would pit one against the other. Today, though, the USSR or Russia, I should say, and China, they are together and the U.S. is the odd man out. Through time, how did we get to this point where the U.S. is now the odd man out? Yes. Uh, well, this is all about uh, what's going on geopolitically. And th let me just first say, um, I'm an American citizen. I don't think the U.S. should be a global empire, should be playing off countries against each other. I, if, if it were up to me and I could wave a magic wand, I'd make the U.S. more like Switzerland, which would be neutral and, and staying out of this crap. Anyways, be that as it may, if you're of the uh, inclination that you want to rule the world and you want America to rule the world, um, you have to look at who are the other big powers in the world, and they're Russia and China, uh, primarily. So if you're, if you're of the opinion that the U.S. must rule the world, I mean, logically, you don't want Russia and China to team up with each other. You want to split them apart. It's just basic strategy. Nonetheless, the folks who are in charge of the U.S. and who do aim to rule the world, they're bungling this. So they are causing Russia and China to go together in an alliance against the United States. And that really throws uh, sand in the gears of how the U.S. Uh, basically runs the world through the IMF, the World Bank, the U.S. dollar as the premier reserve currency. Um, and all the little, uh, all of the um, avenues of power that the U.S. exerts over over the world. So that is a that is a game changer. So if Russia and China come together, what you have is a credible challenge to the U.S., to NATO, to the European Union, um, and that is a big deal because that changes the whole geopolitical game. And I think that's what we're seeing right before our eyes. As part of what we're seeing, we're also hearing the word reset hearing it all over the place, except perhaps in mainstream media. No surprise there. And Paul, Jerome Paul, said it is possible to have more than one reserve currency. How should we be reading the, the tea leaves when we hear the words reset and when we hear the words more than one reserve currency? 
Well, this is a hugely significant coming from Jerome Powell, the one man in charge, more, more in charge of the U.S. dollar than anybody else in the world. And he's coming out and saying there can be more than one world reserve currency. I mean, I, I recently said that's like if Mike Tyson came out and said, you know what, there can be more than one heavyweight champion in the world. No, there can't be more than one heavyweight champion. And the thing is, is that if he is not even trying to maintain the farce of keeping US, U.S. dollar supremacy, why should anybody else? If Jerome Powell doesn't think the U.S. dollar is going to be supreme, the number one currency, the main world reserve currency, why should anybody else? Why should you? Why should me? Why should I do it? Why should you do it? Um, so this, this is coming straight from the horse's mouth. Um, and I don't know, like, if you don't get it at that point, like, this is the chairman of the Fed saying that there can be more than one world reserve currency. If you don't, if that, if that doesn't, like, shake you, and make you think as somebody who may hold dollars, there's nothing that will like that. That is that is the you know that's it. If that if that doesn't cause you to, to reconsider, I don't know what will. But that is it's it's hugely significant, hugely significant because it means uh, the dollar's days are numbered and not numbered. I mean, this is like imminent. I mean, people have been talking about the end of dollar supremacy for a long time. But when you have the Fed chairman come out and acknowledge it openly, that is a whole different ball game. So I don't think there's a lot of time uh, for people who have dollars. I mean, it's, it's going to turn, I think it's going to turn into a hot potato very, very soon. It's, it's, uh, so yeah, the time, it means the time is short. You don't have a lot of time to, to, uh, react to this. So what do you do? You would look to put it into, um, other assets, hard assets. And we can talk about that later. Going back to your other comment about the reset, this is uh, a very uh, strange thing because, of course, we've seen um, the so-called uh, self-identified masters of the universe use these term Great Reset, World Economic Forum, um, you know, whoever voted for these guys. I mean, not that democracy, you know, is necessarily a good thing, uh, but, you know, who put these people in charge? Who anointed them the leaders of the world? Um, and, you know, so this is all, they've got a very uh, sinister agenda. I think that's very clear. And they're not even hiding it anymore. They're talking about um, resetting the financial system, resetting the world. I mean, this is, we could talk about this for hours. Um, but yes, this is part of it uh, with what's going on with the dollar. Um, they, in, in short, let me just try to summarize something that's incredibly complex in, in as, as short of a, a way as I can. They uh, recognize the current system, the US dollar centric system, as Jerome Powell said, it's on its way out. Like it's clear. They, even though they would prefer it to stay the same, they're not, they're not completely stupid. They realize that this system, this monetary system is failing and they need to bridge it to a new system. That's what the reset is all about. They recognize this current system U.S. centric dollar system is on its way out and they're trying to bridge the gap into something else. And we don't know what that next thing is. They don't know what it is. They know what they want it to be. They want it to be kind of a totalitarian control grid with uh, central bank digital currencies, um, movement licenses, uh, you know, vaccine passports. They want all of this. Uh, they want total control over you. And it even goes into health. They don't want you to eat uh, meat. You know, it's not, uh, they want you to eat bugs and beans. And it's so this is a very a full encompassing uh, agenda, this Great Reset. And no doubt it's, it's it, you know, let's be honest. If you know what the Great Reset is, you know what these people are. They're declaring war on the average person. Maybe not in your face and slow and fast, but they are in effect waging a war against your standard of living uh, against regular people all around the world. So it's a very, very uh, nefarious thing, and people need to understand it and react to it before it's too late. Yeah, it's some great points there because people are wondering, you know, what is the coal dollar? Even Or even if we're going to have a dollar, people say the one is not ready. People look at the rearview mirror. They, they recall the SDR. So I think, like you said, no one knows. Even if it's a central bank digital currency, What's it going to look like? Is there going to be just one? Are there going to be multiple CBDCs on, on perhaps one platform? Nobody really knows. How do you see it? Yes, uh, don't, I, I see it like this. Don't let governments, U.S. government, Chinese government, any government or the IMF, don't let any government tell you what money is. 
it, it, money does not necessarily come, need to come from government. That's a total uh, misnomer that the average person doesn't understand. I mean, it's much like if you were to transport yourself back in time and ask the average person in the Soviet Union, where do shoes come from? They would say, well, the government makes shoes. Where could the shoes come from? Who else could make the shoes? And it's the same kind of thing when you ask anybody else in the world, where does money come from? They, it's, it's the same kind of mentality here. The reality is money doesn't need to come from the government. Money is something not complicated. It's two things. It's very simple. Storing value and exchanging value. So if you have anything that stores value and exchanges value, that can be money. And it doesn't need to be these little pieces of paper that governments create out of nothing with no effort. So what I would say to your question is, be a sovereign individual. Realize for yourself, what is the best money for you? And go from there. For lots of people, that's going to be hard assets. It's going to be gold, silver, uh, Bitcoin. What you want in a money, the most important, and I've studied money, you know, money, monetary policy, monetary history uh, for a long time, and it comes down to the most important attribute of money is this. It's hardness, which means hard to produce. In other words, something that's resistant to inflation. You want to put your wealth your stored time. Money is just stored time. You can think of it like a um, like a, a claim check on somebody's time, on human time. That's what money is. You can think of it like that. Would, do you want to put your life, your human time, your energy into something that somebody else can create out of thin air at no cost? You don't. That's ridiculous. It's like putting your life savings in Chuck E. Cheese tokens or your life savings in frequent flyer miles. You don't want to do that. You want to put your life savings into something that somebody else can't make easily. In other words, you want to put it into a hard asset. So that's what real money is. You got to think all of these governments all around the world, Chinese government, U.S. government, Russian government, global government like the IMF and the World Bank, they've basically convinced people, hypnotized people to tell them that their pieces of paper that they create out of thin air, not even pieces of paper, their digital accounting entries that they can create out of thin air in unlimited amounts, that's money. It's not money, it's currency. And there's a difference between that, but people, people think it's money. And that's one of the biggest swindles of all time, of, of, of human history, that people have been brainwashed into thinking something is money that really isn't a good money and not knowing what the good money is. However, you know, as sad as that is, for the people who realize that, the people who understand the the, the trickery that's going on here, um, it can be, uh, you can uh, position yourself to make, you know, big investment profits, not only protect yourself, you can, that's number one, protect yourself, but you can position yourself to gain from this mass psychosis and this mass stupidity. So that's how I look at it. If you're enjoying this interview with Nick Gianbruno from the Financial Underground and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and giving us a thumbs up to let the algos know you want more content like this. And if you want to learn more about systemic wealth protection, please do visit us at www.silverbullion.com.sg. You know, Nick, we've long heard of the petrodollar, but that may soon be coming to an end. We see where Saudi is making a deal with China where they may sell their oil in yuan. They're at least talking about it. What's your take on this? This is huge. It's an enormous geopolitical and financial and monetary development. But first, let me just give a little essential background because there is something called the petrodollar system. And the way it works is you got to go back to the end of World War II when the dollar became the world reserve currency of the world, uh, the premier reserve currency of the world after World War II because the U.S. had the most gold and so forth. It was able to back the dollar by gold, not for the average you know, commoner like me and you, but for among the governments, among the gangsters. So um, if one government wanted to exchange dollars for gold, they could do it at $35 an ounce. Um, but of course, what do you expect happened? They're not going to keep that pledge. Um, if the go government, U.S. government promises they will redeem to other governments gold at $35, of course they're going to print more money than they have gold backing at $35. They did that to fund the Vietnam War and to fund welfare in the 60s. And in 1971, it became apparent to 
particularly European countries, that the U.S. doll that the U.S. was printing more dollars than it could back up with gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. So they started to convert their gold, and the U.S. saw its gold reserves start to dwindle. So what President Nixon did um, on a weekend, on the middle of a weekend where nobody was expecting it, got on TV and announced to the world that the dollar was no longer going to be convertible into gold. It was just going to be a purely paper currency with no backing. That caused an enormous amount of inflation in the 70s, and it really made other countries question, why are we holding these scraps of worthless paper from the U.S. government? There was no reason. It's no longer backed by gold. And then oil-producing countries said, wait a minute, why are we selling our precious oil that there's a finite amount of oil? Why are we selling this for dollars? We want gold. You want our oil? Give us some gold. And the dollar was in a crisis mode at that point. And President Nixon and Henry Kissinger realized this. They realized they had to do something. So what they did is they said, well, we got to give the world a compelling reason to use the dollar now that we've taken the gold out of it. And they found a compelling reason. They made a partnership with Saudi Arabia, which is the largest oil producing and largest oil exporter, um, to make sure that they only sell oil in dollars. That means if China wants to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, they don't use yuan, they don't use Saudi real, they use dollars. The Chinese have to exchange and buy dollars on the foreign exchange market to buy the oil from Saudi Arabia. Not just Saudi Arabia, but basically all of OPEC, all of any country in the world, because Saudi is so big, Saudi can set the benchmark for basically, or was able to, to set the benchmark of how to price oil. Now, that means everybody in the world who wants to buy oil has to go and buy dollars first. That's what bridged the gap between the gold backing, which was removed, and the current system we're in right now, which is the petrodollar system, which is a huge, huge, huge uh, support for the U.S. dollar and its use internationally. So imagine, the oil market is 10 times bigger than the gold market. Imagine that, 10 times the annual production value, 10 times bigger. All of that value and, you know, all of that value is basically being siphoned into the U.S. dollar when it doesn't need to. Um, and that's been why the U.S. has been able to run up a bunch of debt. It's been able to print so much money with uh, uh, little inflation, little price increases until recently, um, more so than any other country could at least. Anyways, why this is big is because recently, for the first time, the Saudis are considering selling their oil to China, not in dollars, but in Chinese yuan. And that's going to be a huge, under, it will undercut the dollar tremendously um, because the Chinese, they're the number one oil importers and they're the number one customer of Saudi Arabia. So Saudis, you know, they're able to twist the Saudis arm and say, we don't want to pay you in dollars, we want to pay you in yuan. And uh, for many years, the Saudis resisted because there is another side to the bargain. The Saudis, what did they get for pricing their oil in dollars? They get protection from the U.S. military. They get, um, they can, you know, the Saudi regime is a horrible, you know, they talk about uh, the U.S. government cries these crocodile tears about human rights and and, and this kind of baloney with other countries, but they never mention a word about Saudi Arabia, which is a horrible country in those terms. So they're, they're, they have a blind spot, and the petrodollar is the reason they have a blind spot. Um, anyways, the Saudis are not happy that the U.S. has not supported them because Saudis have waged a war in Yemen. This is a very interesting war that doesn't get much coverage in the mainstream media. What you have is Yemen is the poorest, poorest. These people live on less than $2 a day, in the, maybe less than that, in the Middle East. The poorest people in the Middle East, the Yemenis, versus the Saudis, who are the richest country in the Middle East. They have the most money. They can buy any fighter jet, any tank <clears throat> that they want, any missile that they want. And you know what? The Saudis lost that war. That's like a David and Goliath kind of uh, story. It doesn't get a lot of attention. Who would you think would win that war? The poorest people are the richest people in the Middle East, and the poorest people are winning, and they're going to win. And the Saudis are upset that the U.S. hasn't given them more support in that war. Therefore, they view the U.S. as not holding up its part of the petrodollar deal, which is why they're turning to China and making a different deal with China. Now that deal isn't concluded, but it's in the works, it's in the open. It's not, they're not even hiding it, it's in the open. You would think such a sensitive discussion, they would try to hide it, they're not. It's out in the open, and this is another very important warning sign for the US dollar. There's a lot of important warning signs like we were talking about before with the sanctions on Russia, the, the China and, and Russia becoming more strategically close. There are 
and, and, and the money printing, the trillions and trillions of dollars of money printing. There are so many imminent warning signs for the dollar that if you see this big picture, like I said before, I urge you not to wait. Don't wait for there to be a panic. It's too late. You can see all of this stuff. And this is just another imminent thing of, of now all of that oil, uh, or very soon, most likely, all of that oil that China is buying from Saudi Arabia, they're not going to be using dollars. That is going to undercut a large portion of demand for U.S. dollars. And if the Chinese aren't going to do it, I'm, I bet there's going to be other countries not doing it too. And remember, Russia is the number two oil producer after Saudi Arabia, and they're not using dollars either. So this is, we're looking at something, uh, we're looking at a paradigm shift that's coming in the international energy markets, the international financial markets. And uh, my advice is if you see this and you you understand what's happening, don't wait for there to be a panic because the average person doesn't get it yet, but uh, I think they will soon. That's a great point. We'll touch on a few of those things in a bit. You know, Nick, the word sanctions, in your view, what will sanctions do in the short term as well as long term for the U.S. dollar? I mean, will it strengthen the, the dollar and the U.S. position as a superpower or will it speed up de-dollarization and weaken the U.S. position as a superpower? Uh, first of all, let me make clear, I reject the use of sanctions in any case because I don't, I don't recognize the government's, any government's ability to tell me who I can transact with. I, if I want a Cuban cigar, if I want Cuban rum as an American, what is the C American government to tell me that I can't have a Cuban cigar or buy Cuban rum or now buy Russian vodka? I mean, I guess they haven't sanctioned that, but that's probably coming very soon. So I reject the notion that the government has any sort of authority to tell you what you can and cannot buy. That is up to you as an individual to do that. Um, be that as it may though, uh, it is reality. I'm not recommending anybody break the law. I'm just uh, talk, explaining why I find it to be illegitimate. Um, yes, the US government has gone sanction happy. They've gone sanction crazy. They've wielded this weapon because they have the US dollar as the reserve currency so they can cut people off from the international financial system. They can punish them financially. It's kind of like an easy button. It's like you want to cause harm and pain to another country. It's kind of like an easy button. However, it's it's very short-sighted because Russia is not like Venezuela. It's not like Cuba. It's not like Iran. We're talking about one of the biggest countries in the entire world. Russia is the number one producer of wheat, natural gas, palladium, um, and other commodities. It's the second largest producer of oil, the second largest producer of, um, I think, coal. And it's huge in the uranium market. It's huge in uh, gas, like uh, neon, uh, titanium, which is used in airplanes, aluminum. This is not a country you can just isolate with sanctions. You're talking about a global commodity powerhouse. So I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to when you try to use this tool, it's one thing to use it against, like I said, smaller countries like Syria or Iran or Venezuela. But if you try to use it against like Russia and China, really, you're going to cut off your nose to spite your face. And I think that's what's happening. I mean, like I said, the people in charge of the U.S. government, they're not necessarily um, the smartest people. If they really, like we were talking about before, if they were um, competent geopolitical strategists, and wanted to maintain the American empire and American dominance, they would not be doing these things. They would actually, if they, what they should be doing is they should be allying with Russia against China because China is going to be the bigger challenger to the US over time. So it's completely backwards. They're bungling it, they're messing it up. So we gotta think if they are screwing up and the sanctions are part of this, they're all part of this. They're, they're going to cause the creation of an alternative monetary and economic system outside of the dollar and outside of the control of the US. It's, it's, a, it's happening right before our eyes. It's happening right now. So you gotta think, that's what they're doing. They're bungling the, they're not, they're not, they're not getting the geopolitical strategy right. Um, and I don't think the market has realized that. I don't think most investors have realized it, but you know what? That's a wonderful opportunity for us because if that was priced into the market, there would be no opportunity for investors. It's not priced into the market. So if you realize that the U.S. is bungling the geopolitical strategy, you have an opportunity to take action now before the market realizes. That's, what, that's the way I see it. You know, Nick, it's long been said that power military power, economic power is moving from the West to the East. Now, I'm here in Singapore, and I can tell you that, yes, it is happening. Uh, when it comes to Asia or to expand Eurasia, 
You've noted that 75% of the world's people live there and most of the world's physical wealth is there. And I found it interesting that you didn't say paper wealth, but you said physical wealth. How should people in the West, maybe particularly the U.S., how should they comprehend this? Yes, what I mean by that is uh, commodities, natural resources, and also human capital, the people, the people actually live there. And uh, to go back to the term Eurasia, it's basically, you look at the continents, it's basically Europe and Asia combined, which makes Eurasia. Um, and why this is a relevant term is because um, you look back at who the previous dominant power in the world was, it was the British before the Americans after World War II, the Americans really picked up the, the mantle for that. But before that, it was the British. And the British were actually, I don't like the game of global empire. I don't like other countries dominating others and wars. I don't like this kind of stuff. However, I, you have to study it because you have to understand how the world works and how history works. And just because I don't like um, that, that kind of thing doesn't mean you shouldn't understand it from a, G, a big picture macro perspective. So. Eurasia is very important to geopolitics because the British recognized that if there was a power that could dominate Eurasia, it would basically be the most, it would be the dominant power in the world. And since Britain couldn't really dominate it all itself, it needed to keep Eurasia divided from uh, another power uh, harnessing the resources of Eurasia. Because if they could do that, then they could challenge the British Empire. And likewise, that kind of thinking has transferred over to the Americans. And the untold American geopolitical strategy is to prevent another power from dominating Eurasia, which could therefore challenge American hegemony, which is, it's the same kind of logic. So why that is very important, because you have Russia and China, who are two of the biggest powers of Eurasia, being pushed together, and you're having this nightmare scenario for U.S. strategists unfold right now. So with, with Russia and China teamed up economically, militarily, what you have is not just a credible challenge to the U.S., you have something that could be uh, more powerful than the West. So that is what is going on big picture geopolitically, and that's going to have huge implications for obviously Western stock markets, the dollar, the euro, um, and all these other toilet paper currencies, and of course, um, gold, silver, and Bitcoin. So getting this big, this is why I focus on the big picture so much, because if you don't get this big picture right, you're not going to get the investments right. You're not going to position yourself right. So that, that's why I focus a lot on the big picture because it's so important. Everything flows from that big picture, that big geopolitical picture, that big monetary and financial and economic picture. Everything flows from that. So that's why I find it so important to get that right. Yeah, you know, you, you said an interesting word there. You, you said the word unfold. I, I also see things unfolding, but Nick, do you think it's also at a point where we could also be in a frog in boiling water scenario where we just don't realize or, or comprehend what's really going on? It's complicated. No, it's no doubt. I mean, things are uh, happening so quickly and in, in, in such enormous significance. It's hard for anybody to really keep track day to day of what's going on. It's very hard. Um, so maybe we can't understand, nobody, nobody's perfect, nobody has perfect information, but we can kind of assemble the pictures. That's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You're not, you know, nobody's able to see the full picture. You can't, it's impossible. It's too complicated for any of the human mind to do it. But you can put together enough pieces to see the big picture. Maybe not the, not the full puzzle put together, but you can put it together to see where things are going. And that's what I try to do. Okay. And Nick, you've also stated that this isn't a good guy, bad guy type of scenario or, or power struggle going on. You said rather you believe they are all bad guys. What leads you to this belief and could you expand on it? Sure. Well, I think all governments are on board for enslaving their citizens. Unfortunately, we've seen that in Canada. We see it in Russia. We see it in China. We see it in the U.S. So I think that's one thing that these guys all have in common is that they want to control and uh, dominate their everyday citizens. They don't want an empowered, uh, sovereign individual uh, as the average citizen. No government wants that. So they all collaborate on this stuff. That's why you see Russia and China collaborating on the COVID restrictions, the totalitarian COVID restrictions, and uh, all sorts of other things that are on board with kind of this globalist Great Reset agenda. However, there's another layer to it, because while they're on board with 
su suppressing and controlling their own citizens, there is a real struggle for who is going to be the dominant power at the top of, uh, so there's, a, there's a, a state versus citizen struggle and a state versus state. There is struggle. So now there's a struggle who is going to be the dominant power at the, among the states. And I think that is, I think that is real. Because right now you have uh, the West is dominant. And now you're looking, uh, Russia and China, they have a seat at the table, but they're not dominant. I mean, obviously the US and NATO and uh, the EU is dominant in this relationship. And they're trying to have a bigger slice at the t I liken it to criminal gangs. Like you look at different gangs in a city, like, or mafia families, they divvy up the different neighborhoods. Like maybe, uh, you know, this mafia family will have uh, Queens or this neighborhood in Queens, this mafia family will control Brooklyn. And what happens is that they, they typically form an informal arrangement among the criminal families or the criminal gangs and say, hey, you stay out of our territory, you stay out of our business and we'll stay out of yours. And usually these things hold up for a little bit, but they always break down because the, the you know there'll be okay well now we want part of this territory we want part of this business and then there'll be a violent struggle between the criminal groups until a new agreement is reached which reflects the new balance of power i mean you just got to think of like countries they're just like criminal gangs on a larger scale so when you think of like how criminal gangs dominate a city uh, and d d divide up a city from uh, amongst themselves. Or oh, the Crips get this section, the Bloods get this section, and uh, the Latin Kings get this section. You know, th just how they do that in a city. That's the same dynamic that's playing out in the world between Russia, China, U.S., Iran. They're just all criminal groups um, fighting for for power. And right now, that arrangement um, between the governments or the criminal groups, it's kind of breaking down because the Russians and the Chinese aren't happy with it and they're trying to push it and create a new, um, a new uh, reality in this situation. So it's very volatile, very volatile situation. You know, you, you touched on, uh, you touched on Canada and going back to Canada, you have said that, uh, Canada set the dangerous precedent that politicians can use banks and money as blunt weapons against their domestic opponents and get away with it. Do you foresee other countries, the other gangs doing what Canada did? Absolutely, because money is, like we were talking about before, money is not real money. It's fake money. It's political money. And that means it's a tool for governments to use. Now, if Canadians had uh, gold coins, uh, they were on a gold coin standard and they all had gold coins, it would have been much harder to freeze people's wealth and, uh, and use it as a weapon. But absolutely, I mean, governments have used, I mean, sanctions are politicizing money, and they, but it's kind of like between states. It is unprecedented what happened in Canada to see that kind of power be used against their own domestic citizens. And uh, I expect this trend to increase, especially as we also see, uh, because the governments around the world derive a lot of their power from the control of money. And it's, it's, I mean, it's enormous. I mean, think of it. They have something, that'd be like if I just created scraps of paper and I forced everybody to use these scraps of paper that I created at no cost, uh, everybody to use it. I'd be very powerful. I could cut people off. I could create wealth out of, or fake wealth out of thin air. So they, they reap an enormous amount of power from this. And since this is kind of slipping out of their hands, they are getting more desperate and increasing the kind of totalitarian controls and restrictions. Unfortunately, I see a lot more of this coming and it couldn't be a better advertisement for non-political real money that has no counterparty risk. I put gold, silver, and Bitcoin in that category because those are all forms of money that have no counterparty risk. If you hold it correctly, there's nobody that can turn off your account. It's, it's, it's sovereign money that you own without the need for anybody else. And I think there couldn't be a better advertisement for that in the past couple of months with, which, what, with what's gone on with Canada and now with Russia because they turned off, basically confiscated Russia's uh, reserves, the, the central bank of Russia's reserves in the US and Europe were basically frozen and confiscated at the flip of a switch. So if that doesn't, if, and, and then a, the same thing happened with Canada. 
and the truckers and the people who supported the truckers. Their bank accounts were frozen, in some cases confiscated at the flip of a switch. And might I add, they explicitly said there's no due process. There is no judicial review. The government basically gave themselves the power to do that. You had no recourse. You couldn't like go to court. It's not like the government had to win a court case and then they won the court case after it was adjudicated and said, okay, now we're gonna freeze this guy's bank account. They've basically turned this into an administrative uh, move that any bureaucrat can do. It's terrible. That's why I think it's been a wonderful advertisement for real money. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And Nick, I'm here in Asia. I'm, I'm here in Singapore and, and we hear US dollar going to hyperinflate. Maybe US is going to go into stagflation. How will that scenario affect, let's say, people in Asia? Yes, well, it's going to affect people all around the world, but in Asia um, in particular. So what that means is that those who are so reliant on the dollar and U.S. as a trading partner, there's going to be volatility. What I would suggest folks in Asia, and not just in Asia, all around the world, but in particular, whatever wherever uh, you are in the world, is look to alternatives. Um, you know, don't put all your wealth in U.S. dollars. I understand businesses and people need to to meet their expenses, but start exploring alternatives, um, whether that be, uh, you know, um, different currencies within Asia that you need to transact with or different banks. Um, so I think you, you look at that, but I don't like any of these fiat currencies, frankly. So yes, I understand there, there's a practical need to use them for day-to-day -day commerce, day-to-day -day life. However, for your long-term savings, um, it's the, the advice is the same. It doesn't mean you should put your long-term savings, move your long-term savings from US dollar to Chinese yuan. I don't think that's a very good move or put your long-term savings in Indian rupees or Russian rubles or Singapore dollars. I don't think any fiat currency is a good long-term savings vehicle. So um, I think that is the same. So in terms for the folks in Asia, for your short-term spending needs and your day-to-day -day practicality needs, look to alternatives uh, to the US. And China, Russia, and India are already, they have an alternative to SWIFT. They have alternative uh, ways to move money between countries. Get familiar with that system because that will be maybe uh, of more practical use. And at the same time, get familiar with what you wanna do with your long-term savings because you don't wanna put your long-term savings in any fiat uh, currency. That's a great point again. You know, Nick, you obviously understand and can see the big picture. What are you doing yourself knowing this day of reckoning, this monetary transition, this reset is, is coming our way? It is. Well, the uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that nobody knows when this is going to happen. It's it impo Nobody knows. It's impossible. It seems like it's more imminent now. However, um, I... <sighs> As long as you know the outcome, what is ultimately going to happen, why wait? You don't need to wait. If you know, if you see the picture, like I said, you put together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and you can kind of see where fiat currencies are going and they're all being inflated away. There's none that is, there, no fiat currency is really strengthening over the long term. We know this. Um, so with that in mind, don't wait for the uh, it to be a, a panic situation because the chances of you being able to make uh, moves in a panic situation is, is very, very, very small. So you have to act before, if you're confident of the big picture, don't wait to act, act now. That's what I am doing. I'm confident, I'm not waiting, I'm not like day trading uh, dollar versus euro or dollar versus one. I, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm confident of the big picture, I've taken action. Um, putting your long-term savings into real money, hard assets that nobody else can create um, with no effort. And then, you know, you can play it to your advantage. You can, once you're, you see this and you see this information asymmetry in the market, because most market participants don't realize this, you can make uh, smart speculations with um, within these trends. You can look at certain commodity producers, which give you leverage to the underlying commodity. And I would put Bitcoin mining companies in this category because they are very similar to other commodity producers. So um, that's one way uh, you can look at uh, various 
I, I like I like looking at different yeah, and then different commodities itself. So I'm, I I really like uh, uranium, for example, because I think the supply demand dynamics there are very attractive. So, um, but I'm I'm primarily focused on the monetary aspect of this big picture story, how to protect yourself and how to make leveraged uh, profits from this by looking at publicly traded companies that deal in these uh, monetary alternatives that I think are really going to shine in the months and years ahead. Okay. You know, Nick, you, you brought up uranium. I, I just want to get your opinion. What about nickel and what happened with the LME this, this past or, or last week? Yeah, well, uh, of course, that has to do with Russia. Russia is a big nickel producer, and nickel is a crucial component in um, lots of things, electric vehicles, batteries, uh, these kinds of things. Um, and basically, from what my understanding is, is it, these, these exchanges, if there is um, you know, some sort of situation that gets out of control, they can just change the rules on a whim and uh shut the trading down so it's a rigged game it's it's like if you know when you're ch when you when you're a child and you're playing like a monopoly or you're playing a board game and there's a bully you're playing against and he's losing and he's like not fair and he flips the board over and like you know it's like what you're not you know it's, it's the same kind of thing with these guys and we've seen that uh with silver they've done it with silver they've done it with gold um which is interesting it'll be interesting to see them do it because they can't really do this with bitcoin Watch, watch and see. I don't think they're going to be able to. I, let me rephrase. I, I think they'll have a much harder time playing these kind of shenanigans with the exchanges and changing the rules on a whim with that. Um, but that can only go on for so long. I mean, that is not a... I mean, in the end, the market always wins. Um, in Argentina, they have a funny saying because the Argentine government likes to manipulate the currency, manipulate markets like all governments do, but they have a saying for it. It's like when you're trying to manipulate the markets like this, what you're trying to do in effect, you're trying to hide the sun. Can't hide the sun. The sun is going to come up in the morning. It's like you try to put, keep the sun down. It's going to come up eventually. So, um, I think this, this, uh, act, what they did on the nickel with the nickel market and the exchange, it's a sign of desperation, a sign of things that are getting out of control. Yeah, they were able to maybe paper it over this time, and they've been able to paper it over for a long time. But sooner or later, that is not going to work. Yeah, we saw the same thing with um, <clears throat> GameStop, where they allowed it to go down. Nickel, they allowed it to go down, but they're not allowing it to, to go up. Nick Gianbruno from the thefinancialunderground.com. Before we wrap up, can you let our viewers know how they can follow you? and get more of your views and the services from your website. Yes, well, they can go to financialunderground.com and I have a very useful free special report um, on a lot of the topics we covered and uh, some steps that folks can do to protect themselves. That's on financialunderground.com. I'm also on Twitter at Nick Giambruno uh, and uh, provide commentary there. And those are the two primary places uh, folks can find me. All right, Nick, Jim, Bruno, we thank you for your time. Hope we can do it again soon. It's been a while, and um, let's just see how things unfold. But I guess the message is don't wait. Yes. Thanks, Patrick. Sounds great. All right. Thanks again, Nick. Appreciate it. That was Nick, Jim, Bruno, sharing his views on the economy, geopolitics, and precious metals. For more info on Nick, please visit www.financialunderground.com. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share it to let the algos know you want to see more of our content. Audio versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.